everyone. My name is Lara Suzuki, and I'm a head of data and AI practice at Google Cloud. I'm very pleased to be with you today to host this Talks at Google event with Mark Pollock, who has demonstrated an extraordinary ability to adapt as he dealt with challenges in his life. Mark will share his story with us in a moment, but to give you some background, he's a former member of the World Economic Forum Young Global Leaders and served on the Global Futures Council on Human Enhancement. He has been awarded honorary doctorates from Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and from Queen's University Belfast. He's a TED speaker and is founder of the global running series called Run in the Dark that happens in 50 cities worldwide each year. There's lots more to tell and to introduce Mark, we have a special video. When I was young, I wanted to compete. Blind, I wanted to go further. When I broke my back, I just wanted to walk again. Amazing video. Mark, a very huge welcome to Talks at Google. Thank you Great. very much for joining us. Great to be here. That's wonderful. Mark, your life seems to be split into multiple phases. And I want to ask you about your blindness first. You first lost sight when you were five years old. But can you tell us what happened when you were 22 years old? Yes, I've got uh, mul multiple chapters. So uh, as you say, so I was born very short sighted. And that means you have a tendency, if you get a knock on the head, you can have detached retina. So I lost the sight in my right eye, as you said, when I was when I was five. But life was pretty much normal. Um, I was at school, riding my bike, go, driving a car, going to university. But at 22, I was just about to graduate with a business studies and economics degree from Trinity College in Dublin. After graduation, I was going to start a job in investment banking in London. And more than a student or a wannabe investment banker, I was I was rowing, I was rowing crew for the university and also for Ireland. So I knew exactly who I was and where I was going. And in the spring of 1998, things changed entirely when I lost the sight of my remaining good eye through detached retinas. And I was immediately no longer involved in student life or I didn't think I could do any job uh, that I would get a job ever and and I was no longer involved in in my crew and in my club so I felt like I was gonna have to sit on the sidelines I I didn't just lose my sight that day I felt like I lost my identity uh, as defined by the things that I that I did and and I and I did what you you might expect. I got my white stick and my guide dog called Larry and a talking computer and and subsequently a talking phone and and that allowed me to study and uh, work and, and 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 play sport. But but I think the impact was that I felt very much like I was going to have to sit on the sidelines as as, as a spectator. Okay, and. Your loss of identity seems to be a critical part of your experience of losing your sight. Perhaps you can outline how the South Pole assisted you your quest to rebuild your identity? Yeah, well, I, I, I suppose I, I, I mean, I, I probably, uh, I wasn't really that interested in working except to make a living to you know, live life. So I wasn't that interested in working. I wasn't that interested in studying. 
but being out there racing that's what i what i missed uh, and it took a while to get back into a boat rowing again i then became an adventure athlete and raced in desert mountains oceans all over the world but it wasn't really until the 10th anniversary after losing my sight that i had a chance to compete at a level that i'd aspired to before i went blind my olympic games if you like and it came in the form of a, a 43 day expedition race in the coldest most remote most challenging place on earth in, in antarctica and to to do it i was going to have to manhole sledges for 43 days for up to 16 hours a day racing against norwegian special forces ex-british royal marines people who had raced to the north pole previously and after a thousand kilometers i had the opportunity to arrive at the south pole um, and i was the first blind person to to do it but that wasn't the driving force the driving force rather was to to move from that feeling like i was sitting on the sidelines watching on and rather being back in the mix as a competitor so the reason i was doing it was because i'd been into racing and competing all of all of my life and i wanted to go down there and put a team together where my blindness would simply be uh, something that we could get around that i could contribute to the team and that we could compete with the other teams in a meaningful way so i was there to race i wasn't there just to do an expedition to the south pole but perhaps uh perhaps to give to give everyone watching a bit of a sense of what it was like down there i might um might play this short video my main goal with with this race i've done quite a lot of adventure races but i've always felt the reason why people pat me on the back is because i've done these things when i'm blind i think this race is regardless of the blindness this race is challenging on its own and i wanted to come and do something that was really inspiring regardless of the blindness nearly one o'clock in the morning and we're about to start our final 46 kilometers this race doesn't compare to the things that i've done before it's been incredibly hard by anyone's standards it's satisfying all of my ambitions and putting a lot of my blind demons to rest this week, 10 years ago, I hadn't been out of the house by myself for, for nine months. I was just about to make my first independent journey uh, in Dublin. Little did I know that it would end up finishing at the, at the South Pole 10 years on. It's just been an incredible adventure. I really feel like I can stand up in front of people now and say, I am an adventurer. Good night, 20 meters. Well done, enjoy it. Much better to see you. That's the silver ball. That's the silver ball, and that's the post that it stood on. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well done, mate. And Lara, I might just, uh, just to continue the, the sort of, Mm -hmm. what it all meant because I suppose the really the point of of showing you that video and and, and explaining this is uh, it's not really about arriving at the South Pole and, and just to tell you why I think that's the case I I needed to raise 150,000 euro to do the event and I had all sorts of ideas on how I might get the sponsorship or get a documentary made and somehow that would pay for it. And, and part of that exercise was writing a, a book. I thought if I wrote a book, I could put the corporate logo on the front of the, 
of the book and write a chapter in the book about the partnership and someone would give us the 150,000 euro. Um, and as part of that, I, I sent off a pitch to 30 literary agents in, in London and none of them came back to me, of course. And I followed up with phone calls and I eventually got through to this guy called Mark Lucas in the Soho agency, who's very well known in the literary world and in, in, in the UK. And I gave him my pitch, told him I was going to go off and race to the South Pole. I'd be the first blind person to do so. But, you know, I really wanted to be there to race. And there's a whole British, Norwegian, Irish exploration narrative around it. And he said to me, well, look, I appreciate you uh, telling me all about what you're going to try and do. But as everyone in my office knows, there's nothing I find more boring than icy tales of people racing to the North Pole, South Pole or climbing Everest and then inflicting a book on the world. So... I wish you luck, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to try and get you a book deal, which of course he didn't, and there is no book. But I went off, did the race, came back, and I, I was asked to go on BBC Breakfast Television, and I had four and a half minutes to talk about our race to the South Pole and our success. And when I was coming out of the of the studios in in London, I was checking my phone to see if anyone had written to me, uh, and there weren't too many, but. This guy Mark Lucas had written, and and he said, uh, "I've just watched you on BBC Breakfast Television, and um, I've got to tell you, I've not changed my mind." And you know, I was sort of laughing to myself, thinking he did, it, he didn't need to go to the trouble of of writing to me, but he wrote, "What was it really about? What was it really about?" And and it was that line that has been very important in answer to your question. Because what it was really about was not the ice and the cold weather and the distance and the isolation and the hardship. And um, it was about me feeling normal again. And I know the word normal comes as a, with a, a, it's sort of a loaded word. But for me, normal meant competing, pursuing success, risking failure, defining myself by my willingness to try. Normal for me was not sitting on the sidelines, looking on and risking nothing. So I suppose that is the journey from the hospital bed to the South Pole. Uh, it was a transition from being a spectator or feeling like a spectator to being a competitor again. Well, that is a fascinating story. And clearly you didn't have to be an expectator and you found your way back to being a competitor. And more recently, you have become increasingly interested in the science of human performance. Perhaps you can share elements of your performance potential model with us? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know whether it's because I'm getting older and I'm now trying to work out why that all happened and I'm reflecting more, but I wish I knew all this when I, before I was racing to the South Pole. But you're right, I, I've become interested in not only why I did what I did physically. Um, but some of those races started to alert me to the to the fact that there was something else going on. There were conditions to allow me to make that move from being a spectator to being a competitor. Um, perhaps there was something psychological, per perhaps there was something neurological going on. And I've been looking at the research from lots of different perspectives, but the conditions that allow us to move from being spectators to competitors seems to be defined by clarity. Competitors have great clarity, a very broad why of what they're going to do. Uh, in my case, it's everything I do is about helping people build resilience and collaborate with others so they achieve more than they ever thought possible. That's a very broad why, but it comes down to medium term strategic goals annual goals, clear monthly goals, weekly priorities, daily actions, a kind of clarity stack that rolls up to achieve your lifetime ambition. Um, in terms of commitment, these things don't seem to happen overnight. When you look at peak performers, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. There's no one comes along like winning the lottery and just gives you the, gives you the result. People work consistently over time, like Angela Duckworth's work on, on grit, uh, passion and perseverance for long-term goals. People stick in there making small decisions, compounding over time to achieve what they've 
what they want to achieve. And the other thing with peak performers is they seem to put a network of people around them that allows them to achieve their their goals and ambitions. So I become interested in in creating the environment, creating the conditions to perform and reach my performance potential as commitment, uh, clarity, and connection. And at the heart of all of that, moving down into the kind of the neuroscience of it, uh, we see this uh, uh, non-ordinary state of consciousness that we call flow. Okay. So if we look into your model, you have mentioned clarity, commitment, and connection. And at the heart of all of this, is this non-ordinary state of consciousness called flow state. Perhaps can you explain why being a competitor is neurologically addictive and how that relates to flow? Uh, yeah, well, uh, so questioning why competitors do what they do, I've, I've come across flow uh, in, in relatively recent times, but I've experienced it loads of times. I think we all have, um, but flow, uh, fl flow was named, the, the phrase was coined by uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi in the 60s and 70s. He actually just uh, re recently died, on, unfortunately. But flow is an optimal state of consciousness where we perform our best, we feel our best. It's commonly known as being in the zone in sport, uh, in the groove, in the pocket. Uh, in If you're, if you're uh, playing jazz ensembles, it's called being in the, in the pocket. But when we're in flow, we lose our sense of self, self, time stands still or speeds up, things become effortless, we recognize patterns that and come up with answers that we didn't know that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, co coders and gamers get into this, sports people get into it, but you get into it socially. Uh, and McKinsey found that people perform 500% better when they're in flow. People are way more creative for days after uh, whenever they've been in flow. And the reason I say it's uh, that being a competitor is neurologically addictive is that when we're in flow, addictive neurochemicals like dopamine, uh, uh, norepinephrine, endorphins, and andromide, serotonin, and when you're with people, a little bit of oxytocin is released into the system, which are necessarily uh, uh, addictive. Now, I found myself in sport getting into the flow state as a competitor loads of times, loads of memories of that, but I didn't know that that was happening until much, much later. When I was sitting on the sidelines as a spectator, I couldn't access flow, so I couldn't, I couldn't access those feel-good neurochemicals that were there. So the reason I say that uh, being a competitor is neurologically addictive is because we access flow more often, and when we're in flow, we're uh, getting these neurochemicals for, for free. And that is quite an interesting uh, um, concept. And there's a clear rationale for being in a flow state. So maybe you can share a little bit about the neuroscience of flow and what role recovery plays in delivering peak performance. Um, yeah, well, I think that there's a danger or a dark side to being a competitor and, and, and talking about performance because there's this uh, view that working harder and harder and harder means that you're going to reach your, your performance potential over time. And you might be able to do it with bursts of, of, of energy for short periods of time, but, but we're not, we're just neurologically not able to do that over the long term. Um, and we can't just switch uh, flow on and off. It's, it, we can't get in and out of the zone like it's a light switch. And Herbert Benson, who's a Harvard car cardiologist, uh, started to come up with an idea that, in fact, it was more of a cycle. And that cycle is struggle, release, flow, and recovery. And they're interdependent, so you can't get into the flow state without release, without recovery, without being in struggle. So struggle is whenever we're uh, trying to do something new and we're loading and overloading the brain or the body uh, cortisol and adrenaline is in the system to help us focus but it's pretty unpleasant it, but it's just a necessary part of uh, achievement 
the danger is that lots of people just stay there and never get out of the struggle phase, the unpleasant place of, of struggle, because mm. they don't do the release bit. I say they, I'm talking about myself as well here, by the way, uh, mm. but we don't do the release phase. Short tactical breaks constantly throughout the day, every hour, every half hour. And that releases nitric oxide into the system to push the stress uh, neurochemicals out and allow for those addictive neurochemicals of flow to come into the system to allow us to perform at our best and feel our best. But we can only stay there for maybe three hours at a time, a couple of times a day. We can't be in flow all of the time. And anyone who says that they are performing at their best all of the time, they're not. Yeah. Neurologically, they're simply not. And when you come out of it, when you go into recovery mode, you feel terrible. And it's a really dangerous place for competitors because competitors want to keep going, want, pu want to keep pushing. And when you feel terrible after crashing out of the flow state, you feel unmotivated, useless, lazy. But that's exactly when you must stop and recover. So from a neurological perspective, what I found particularly interesting was that in sport, a training program has all elements of the flow cycle built in. But in life and work, we don't necessarily have that. So we've got to artificially design our calendars and our days to take account of the neurology of long-term peak performance, which is flow release, uh, struggle, release, flow and recovery. Mm, thanks for that, Mark. Um, well, perhaps we can jump back into your story for a moment, because not long after you got back from the South Pole, things changed again. Perhaps we can outline what happened to you next. Uh, yeah, well, it doesn't it doesn't improve, Lara. Uh, the the second half of the story is not uh, it, it doesn't get any better. And and frankly, I thought that arriving at the South Pole uh, should have been the end of the story. But uh, a year after getting back from the South Pole, when I felt like I was unstoppable, when I'd rebuilt my identity as a competitor, it was at that point that I was in England at a rowing regatta, and on the second night, I fell from a second story window onto the concrete below and the people who found me thought i was dead uh, the doctors in intensive care suspected i was going to die and when i realized what had happened i wonder whether dying might have been the best outcome because i'd fractured my skull i had three bleeds on my brain massive internal injuries and a, and a spine damaged in two places leaving me with no feeling or movement from my waist down and all of that was added to, to the blindness. And lying there in intensive care, I was surrounded by paralyzed people, clearly paralyzed people, some from the neck down, some from the chest, some from the waist down. And I didn't know if I was one of them yet in those early days. And over time, it became clear that I was. And I discovered that spinal cord injury strikes at the very heart of what it means to be human. That turned me from my upright, running, jumping form into a seated version of myself. And paralysis doesn't just interfere with the feeling and movement. It also interferes with the body's internal systems that are designed to keep us alive. Nerve pain, spasms, pressure sores, time in hospital, shortened lifespans. All these things are common and exhaust even the most well-supported, privileged, determined of the 60 million people around the world who have some kind of paralysis. With the right supports, it's manageable. People live lives in wheelchairs, uh, full and meaningful lives. And I am in the wheelchair and have completely accepted that. But running acceptance and hope in parallel, what I found strange was that up to this point in history, it had proven to be impossible to find a cure Yet history is filled with accounts of the impossible made possible through human endeavor, the kind of human endeavor that took polar explorers to the South Pole at the start of the last century, uh, and the kind of human endeavor that's going to take a new wave of explorers to Mars in the middle part of this century. So inspired by those stories of exploration, I started asking myself, why can't that same human endeavor cure paralysis in our lifetime? And based on some of the people that we now work with, I believe that it can. And I might mention two groups. 
Uh, one is a group in San Francisco at a company called Exobionics, who, Lara, I know uh, you will probably have an interest in because they're building robots uh, with artificial intelligence built, built into the system. Um, they're capturing data points from wearable robots with motors at the knees and at the hips, computers on the back, sensors all over the feet. But they were building wearable robots to allow someone like me to stand and move in a rehab context, not out in the world, but standing up out of my wheelchair and walking with the robot's help. And then there were a second group at UCLA in Los Angeles who were using electrical stimulation of the spinal cord to boost the nervous system to increase the activity, the sensory activity in and the motor output, but using the nervous system, not, not just stimulating the muscles. So we started to get to know these two groups, Exobionics and the scientists at UCLA led by a visionary scientist called Reggie Edgerton. And I know that it's all a little bit abstract. So perhaps I will, perhaps I'll show you a video to show you what kind of impact uh, these technologies were having when I was using them. So let's uh, play the video, please. I don't want to be stuck in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. The goal is to try and walk. If I lay in bed or just sat in my wheelchair, I would be, I'd be giving, giving up completely. I know that the fitter and stronger I can get, the more chance there is that I will be successful to trial a set of robotic legs. It's good to be back. physical exercise guys, the technology and robotics people, and the scientists. Uh, how you doing? Great to see you. Good to see you. Go, 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 go. Good, good. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Go on, Mark. Go on. Go, 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 go. Wow. <laughs> well done. Good. It's really exciting. It's ridiculous. It is it, really. That was a quite fascinating video. And it seems like you found people pushing the boundaries of what is possible. But you identified a problem in the system which you began to tackle. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, Look, the status quo was in hospital, moving from the hospital bed into the wheelchair and going and living an independent life was where the story ended. That was the prime, the primary aim. Uh, and it was, it, it was going to be the reality for me. In fact, it still is as I'm still sitting here in my wheelchair. But the exciting thing was we found Reggie and his team at UCLA. We found the team at Exobionics. And we started to work with them. And you saw me, hopefully in the video there, lifting my left leg up as a guy called Yuri Gorosomenko was uh, encouraging me, go, 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 as he was electrocuting my spine. And then I've walked over a million and a half steps in, in my exobionics robotic legs. So we found these kind of world-class competitors they, they had to be to create these incredible groundbreaking technologies but what we didn't see much evidence of was collaboration and i think that happens often whenever people are so 
focused on their groundbreaking work that they don't have the time, space, capital, resources to look sideways and collaborate and work with each other. So making those connections seemed to be where we could contribute. And back in 2014, we created our first major collaboration with those two groups. And I moved uh, to the lab at UCLA with my paralyzed legs, my robotic legs, my fiance, and every morning the scientists put electrodes onto the skin of my lower back to push electricity into my damaged nervous system as I stood in my robot. And for the first time since I was paralyzed, I could feel my legs beneath me, not like I used to, but they felt substantial. I could feel the meat of the muscles around the bones in my legs. And as I walked, because of the stimulator on my back, I was able to voluntarily move my legs as I did more with my legs. The robot did less with its motors in real time. And as I did more, my heart rate started to creep up to 150 beats a minute, which is a decent training zone for running. The muscles, which had almost disappeared entirely, started to rebuild themselves. Uh, Simon started to describe it like the moment when Iron Man puts the mini arc reactor into his chest and becomes something else entirely. Now, I don't think we're quite there yet, but we are exploring the intersection where humans and technology collide with robotics, with electrical stimulation, optogenetics is coming down, uh, down the line, uh, biological interventions, pharmacological interventions, brain machine interfaces. And we would hope that all of those technologies would come together in a closed loop and work seamlessly together. But coming back to your, your question, whenever I look back at exploration stories like those stories from 100 years ago when people were racing to the South Pole, they're presented with the lead characters, Shackleton, Scott, Amundsen, like it was some kind of individual hero story, but it wasn't. It was about people working together to achieve more. And then when we look at the work we're doing to try and cure paralysis in our lifetime, it's very clear that no individual scientist or technologist or investor or philanthropist or charity is going to do it on their own. It's going to be about people working together to achieve more. So being a competitor, a world-class competitor, working on your own as a soloist is good, but it's not good enough. The only way we really make the big breakthroughs is when we find a way to collaborate. So like the earlier decision to be a spectator or a competitor, that's that's one point. Compe being a competitor is is desirable, uh, but perhaps the question is how do we how do we get those competitors to come together and collaborate? Because that's where we make the big breakthroughs. Yes. So you are on a mission to cure paralysis in our lifetime and commenting in a recent article for the Milken Institute, which is a global think tank, you said. Today, in this work, I feel more aligned with the polar explorers than I ever did racing to the South Pole. Like those early geographic expeditions into the unknown, there was no individual hero. The true story was always one of collaboration. Perhaps you can expand on this point and, and explain about how we can create the conditions for soloists to become collaborators. Uh, yeah, well, look, it's, I mean, I, I think I probably always go back to these stories of exploration because there, there's there's so much uh, to be learned from those stories at the extreme of human experience. And, and a little bit like what I was talking about early, earlier on, I started to wonder why were the scientists not working together with the technologists and why did the charities all fall out with each other? And why does an investor not... Um, deal with the scientist and talk to the scientist very well there's fragmentation right across the system so what conditions or what's what's affecting that uh, soloist behavior and how do we create the conditions for collaboration so we, we worked with uh, accenture and milken and the world economic forum and various people are on a piece of research and what we discovered was this framework 
of what helps to create the conditions for collaboration. And that is what, what game are we playing? Are we playing a lower order competitive finite game that leads to patterns of fragmentation, unhealthy competition and erosion of trust? Or are we playing a higher order collaborative infinite game where we have the opportunity to create the conditions for collaboration, where we can have healthy rivalries, not unhealthy competition. And we have the chance to enhance or build trust. Uh, I think very often, and I come from a competitive uh, world of games, playing finite games, but really to make the big breakthroughs, we need to step back and consider playing infinite games where there's enough room for everyone to win. Um, when it comes to the approach, I see this as uh, an expedition, a new expedition into the unknown, like the polar explorers were doing geographically 100 years ago. We're trying to do this in our efforts to cure paralysis. So what, are, what approach are we taking? And when we need flat collaborative approaches, the research seems to suggest that those flatter collaborative approaches work whenever we have a collection of people who are open to problem solving, who value the opinions of all sorts of people, regardless of, of rank, longevity, uh, job title, and also people who are prepared to come up with new ideas for these novel challenges. Where it doesn't work is whenever people are directive. They only listen to people because of who they are and they try to use old ideas to deal with new challenges. So we've got the game, we've got the approach, uh, and then we've got the dynamics. Now, I I don't need to tell people in Google, I'm sure you're all very well aware of uh, Project Ar Aristotle, where this idea that skills, longevity, rank, uh, was not the differentiator and is not the differentiator of teams performing well or people moving from being soloist to collaborator, but rather it's things like psychological safety, uh, where people feel challenged but not threatened, dependability, people turn up and do what they said they were going to do and deliver, clarity, going back to my earlier comments about the clarity stack, you know where you're going and where you fit in, meaning that what you're doing matters in and of itself, an impact that something is going to be of use for someone else at some point. So. I've been really interested in what elements of that framework are in place in our world where we have scientists, technologists, investors, regulators, charities, philanthropists, people like me with injuries, family members of that. What games are they playing? What approach are they taking? And what's going on with the team, team dynamics? Uh, and mm -hmm. very often, because it's difficult, it's difficult to collaborate. It's much easier to just get on and do our own thing. Um, very often we see gaps. Uh, we we see gaps in what's happening, and that leads to soloist behaviour, not because people are bad, but because the conditions are, aren't necessarily in place for uh, the incentives to lead people to collaborate. Understood. And with this context set for soloists to become collaborators, I'm very keen to understand a little bit more about why you have become so interested in trust in these recent years. Well, I think when you when you strip it all away, you know, what game are you playing? What approach are you taking? What's going on with the team dynamics? That sort of a philosophical perspective, perhaps leadership theory. Um, but really, when it gets down to it, it's about people trusting each other. And after 10 years of working on projects that helped scientists to raise $15 million to help commercialize their technologies, and that technology, one of the, in one of those cases, it's, it's now raised another um, $100 million. We need to do that time and time again. But after 10 years of, of working in this area as a guinea pig, helping to raise money, working right across the system, we saw these patterns of fragmentation, unhealthy competition, erosion of trust. We started saying, well, how can we improve that situation? And a few years ago, I read Chris Voss's book, uh, Never Split the Difference. And Chris was the former chief hostage negotiator for the FBI. And he's an expert in human connection. 
on building trust. And what he says is you, you can't say to a bank robber who's got four hostages, hey, give me the, give me two hostages and you keep the other two and we'll call it quits. You can't do that. The hostage negotiator must get 100% of what they need and the, the hostage taker must get 100% of what they need. The hostage negotiator, all hostages out. The hostage taker to be listened to, recognized, acknowledged. And the way you go about that is by using language that helps to build that connection and that trust. And I suppose whether we're talking about high stakes negotiations or putting networks of people together to cure paralysis, or we're talking about the teams we work in in, in business, it's about connecting with people. And very often that comes down to the language that we use or that we don't use that either puts people on the back foot and erodes trust or helps to enhance trust. And I suppose in my own example, a scientist who's been working on 50 years on a uh, on a piece of neuroscience very often speaks a completely different language than a Wall Street investor. And often that breaks the break, it leads to breakdown in trust. And we're going to try and solve that, bring people together uh, to cure paralysis. As we attempt to collaborate with other people, what does neuroscience tell us about how to build trust? What does it tell us? Uh, yeah, well, sort of running alongside uh, what I was learning from Chris Voss from uh, hostage negotiation, I started to wonder well, what was going on, what was underlying that. And Paul Zak, uh, a professor at Claremont Graduate University in California, has looked at this in in some detail and in 2001 he made a, a mathematical uh, connection between trustworthiness and economic performance so sort of at a macro level at a country level the more trustworthy a country was the better its economic output was but what he couldn't do was explain why do two people trust each other in the first place or not as the case may be so he did a a 10-year study to try and find out what was going on and the answer was the release of oxytocin and the release of oxytocin was the same and had the same impact across cultures from Papua New Guinea tribes in Papua New Guinea right through to US boardrooms and it started to explain what Chris Voss had been finding in the field using language to build trust with hostage takers and it seems to be the sort of thing that we're missing in our efforts to bring people together to cure cure paralysis the release of oxytocin, oxytocin. Now, he's got eight um, behaviors that, that we can all do. And he's got a great book called uh, Trust Factor. Things like recognizing when people do a good job, uh, being open, uh, being vulnerable, uh, caring about other people, loads of very simple things that we can do to set direction to get out of people's way and to treat people like human beings as opposed to human resources. So there, I really have been interested in soloist versus collaborators, just an idea, something that I've observed. What are the conditions, the game, the approach, the dynamics, but, but really I wanted to dig down into it and see what was going on at the, at the neuroscience level, uh, how we build or erode trust with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. That's fascinating. Mark, we have heard your story. And, but before moving into questions and answers, I really would like to ask you, what would you share with your younger self and with all of us? Um, well, look, I think I, I, I've, I've boiled it all down to the idea that sometimes we choose our challenges and sometimes challenges choose us. What we decide to do about it that's what counts and it's often all that we can control. So decide to be a competitor, pursuing success and risking failure, defining ourselves by our willingness to try. That's one, ele one element. But I think on the flip side, we must decide to be collaborators because that's where the big breakthroughs happen. That's what I'd tell, tell myself. And I would collaborate much harder, much earlier. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's a very good uh, advice and a uh, piece of of, of advice for us. Um, so now we can go to questions and answers and let's check if we have any questions for the from the audience. 
So we have uh, someone saying thank you for this talk, Mark. Any advice for folks struggling to push through any adversities they are facing where they might not have the motivation to do so? Um, yes, well, uh, well, I've, that seems to be, unfortunately for me, my specialist subject uh, after the blindness, the paralysis. And of course, we're all feeling it in this pandemic that we're living through. I, uh, I, I did a... I did a TED talk a couple of years ago with with uh, my fiance Simon, and we spoke about this in in some detail. I I think that it is dangerous to be an optimist because optimists rely can rely on hope alone, and if you rely on hope alone, you run the risk of being disappointed and demoralized if the best case scenario uh, doesn't play out. It's too miserable to be a pessimist all the time. So what I try to do is to be a, a realist. And a realist has as much hope as the optimists, uh, but a realist accepts the reality of now. So I'm, first of all, confronting the brutal facts, as uh, Admiral Stockdale uh, used to say, confront the brutal facts or have the discipline to confront the brutal facts as a starting point. I'm anchoring myself with a sense of control by accepting what I can control and forgetting about what I can't control. And then I try to extend timelines beyond the moment, the lack of motivation, the crisis, the overwhelm. I try to extend timelines towards a better future and that that is fueled by hope. So it's being a realist, dealing in facts, anchoring and hope. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that, Mark. We have another question from the audience, and this question is, Mark, thanks so much for sharing your story. What can viewers of this talk do to support your mission to cure paralysis? That is a very important question. <laughs> well, yeah, well, look at that. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, well, we, we have recently uh, started a charity not to be in competition with, with, with other great charities like uh, the Christopher Madonna Reeve Foundation or Wings for Life and many, many other uh, charities around the world. But we're, we've started a charity called Collaborative Cures, uh, which you can see at collaborativecures.com. And what we're trying to do there is raise money so that we can understand how to remove the barriers to collaboration, to create the conditions for collaboration in this space. How can we get the scientists to access more money through the regular channels? How can we get the scientists to collaborate with the technologists, the investors, the entrepreneurs, the philanthropists, the charities, the governments? How can we create the conditions to do that better? So that what we want to try and see, the impact that we're trying to have is to reduce translation from the lab through the commercialization process to the clinic from 50 years to 10 years and what we want to try and do is increase the number of $100 million uh, uh, commercialization projects that are out there. So doing them quicker and raising bigger ticket projects because too many scientists and commercialization pro projects are having to tinker around with small amounts of money. They need to be about $100 million to get out there. So reducing time and increasing speed to market. Uh, but collaborativecures.com explains what we have going on there. What would be your message for technologists and uh, entrepreneurs out there trying to create app products? What would be your advice for them in terms of accessibility and to make sure that uh, the product will serve all of society? Um, well, I, I mean, if I if I just talk about uh, about the the team at Exobionics, I. I was one of their early enthusiastic uh, test pilots. And what they did was I got a device and, and I started to put it through, it through its paces. And I think it was to do 500 steps an hour. And we got up eventually to 3000 steps an hour. But we worked together, me, the user, giving feedback, breaking the device. So the aluminum parts were redesigned in steel and we had an open conversation but i i was i knew nothing about robotics the only qualification i had was because i was paralyzed and it goes back to my comments about the approach that we're taking 
are we directive and only listening to people who have PhDs uh, or have been in the company for a particularly long period of time or were there as founders or whatever? Or are we listening to all sorts of people from inside and outside the company? The other interesting thing that EXO did was they were engineers and, and computer scientists, so they were good at building the hard part of the robot. But for the soft goods to protect the vulnerable skill of par uh, skin of paralyzed legs, which gets damaged pretty easily, they actually worked with an artist to produce the soft goods and how that would mold around the legs and around around the body. So I suppose, um, and Lara, I know you uh, you have perspectives on on this, but universal design, listening to people with mm -hmm. perspectives, gaining feedback is good for everyone because really when whenever we start to, uh, when it works for everyone, uh, that's when it really starts starts to move and universal design helps get, get us there. Yeah, that is really fantastic. Uh, there is a common phrase that people say, if you design for people with disabilities, you design for everyone else. And yeah, that is uh, and that is really a very uh, important message. I'm very, very curious to know a little bit more about the dog you had when uh, Larry, and because I have a support dog, I'm autistic and I have a support dog. He's a golden retriever. His yeah. name is Yoshi and he's very, very cute. And I didn't have to train him. He could uh, identify when I was in distress. And then he comes and with his paw, get me to stop or get my husband to come and help me. How was your experience with Larry and um, how did you bond with him? Can you please tell us a little bit more, more about that? Well, yes, I mean, look, the dogs are brilliant. And I think since lockdown, the whole world has got a dog. So the offices, you know, we're going to have kennels. Uh, we're going to have to come up with a new word with people bringing dogs to the office. They'll, they'll be trying to... They'll be trying to forge uh, assistance dogs passes so they can get them into the office. But, okay, at uh, Google, we have the Dogglers. Uh, we, there are the, Google, uh, the Googlers dogs, so we can uh, we can bring them to the office. So that's quite great. Well, I I, I don't know if it's the same with uh, the assistance dogs, Lara, but with guide dogs, they try to match the personality of the dog and and the owner. So you go and meet the dog in the beginning, and they they get an understanding are you going to be living in the countryside or in the city are you going to be going to nightclubs or are you going to be uh you know not going out at all and larry was you know i was whatever 22 at the time i was going to pubs i was in the city center i was working in the office and he needed to be he couldn't be too sensitive he needed to be pretty robust and he was brilliant in fact he was so robust that he he nearly didn't pass his training because he was messing around too much but that's why he was so brilliant and uh i went and lived in a, an apartment on my own with larry and the difference between the white stick not ever not all blind people have this perspective but i found the difference between the white stick and the and my guide dog larry was i i felt less self-conscious even though the guide dog screeched you know mm -hmm. this guy is blind i felt less self-conscious with the the dog as compared to the white stick and I, I felt a little bit safer um so it was just it it helped with the rebuild of my identity because that goes hand in hand with the rebuild of of confidence and uh and larry was a was very much a big part of that yeah that that's really really amazing and adorable to hear uh larry's story and one of the things that i wanted to ask you is um is this thing about the sense of belonging how we humans, we can belong to places and when we can go to places that we don't have to check ourselves at the door. So there's a lot being discussed nowadays about diversity and creating teams with people from different perspectives and walks in lives. Uh, what is like the message you could give for uh, employers or for people around the globe uh, in terms of like uh, inclusion and diversity in, in, in the workplace or uh, in any environment? yeah yeah look i've been i've been speaking to senior leaders about this over the last particularly over the last couple of months and and before we get into any sort of philosophical co comments or my, my perspective on work 
the lack of understanding and and the fear around disability is is extraordinary like there you know the basic idea that could i do my job if i went blind I had this conversation with one guy and he you know he closed his eyes and he and he and he thought that he would have to have a team of scribes as he called it in order to write things out for him but of course we have technology that I mean, I can use my computer and my talk, my phone talks back to me and my computer talks back to me. So the, it's, I think sometimes whenever we're campaigning as people with disabilities, we've got so many st- statistics and, and complicated examples, but the understanding, the basic understanding that we can get to work, that we can use our computers and that we, and that we, we don't want to be sitting on the sidelines as spectators. We are, we want, and we're more than capable of contributing to high-performing teams. Um, you know that sort of comes some way down the line. It's it's a very basic education. And of course, the other thing is, people are scared of getting it wrong because everyone's so jumpy about getting things wrong. And a friend of mine called Stephen Frost, who was the inclu- head of inclusion for the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, he's got a great book and he has a consultancy on this whole area. But he he said when he was, they were trying to train the 200,000 volunteers and nobody could get it right. They didn't have enough time to train everyone. Culturally, they would get it wrong anyway. And they bo- boiled it down to a pretty good principle, I think, which is just ask. Just yeah. ask. And no doubt the person with the disability will give you their perspective. And of course, the other thing is, I don't know what you think, uh, Lara, but you know, just because I'm blind, if I'm being difficult or unreasonable, I shouldn't get a, a pass. But just because I'm blind, you know, we can we can also be idiots despite our disabilities. I I, I understand that uh, quite well in terms of uh, we cannot make assumptions. Uh, don't make assumptions. Just ask. And if you're talking to someone with a disability, talk to the person, not to their uh, translator uh, or, a, or because that does not create much of an empathy. And um, do you have any tips or any suggestions for people who want to become um, allies and support the work of people with disabilities? Um, I suppose, I suppose maybe it comes back to that. that that just ask a piece. I mm-hmm. I think if the if the assumption and the principle is that someone with a disability wants to do a good job, and that this is the case, that if take the disability away, the basic principle is that people want to if we're if if we use my, my language, they want to compete. They want to pursue success and risk failure. They want to do their best. They want to perform. They want to work with others in, me- in a meaningful way. Uh, there are elements of the disability that you just, you know, I need a computer and I need a wheelchair. Right? That's that's it. But if the basic principle is that everyone wants to perform at their best, and then what is unique to the particular disability or the particular person, the uh, allies can just ask, find out what people need, and uh, and as you say, Lara, don't make any don't make any assumptions, good or bad. Don't make assumptions that I am uh, that you're going to get it wrong, or that I'm going to be offended, or whatever. It's just about treating each other like human beings. Yeah, that that is true, and I think that it sums up to everything that is like being courageous, uh, not being afraid of asking, don't make assumption, and have a lot of uh, empathy. And that is like a word that I like a lot. And pretty much people tend to think that people with autism, they cannot feel empathy. And that is so wrong because I have a lot of empathy for uh, for people. And that is goes back to not making an assumption. Mark, it has been sensational to host you uh, here, uh, to have you here with us at Talks at Google. If you would like to know more about Mark and his activities, please check out the video description for more information. And Mark, once again, thank you so much for being with us. It has been amazing to uh, talk and to learn more about your life. And I Thanks. hope you have enjoyed. 
Thanks for having me. And I'm just uh, disappointed that we get, didn't get to do this at all in a in a room together. But maybe uh, maybe sometime. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that would be amazing. So have an amazing time. Thank you for uh, staying tuned with us. And bye bye for now.